Now on KGW News, a wildfire whipped by the winds spreads quickly, bringing in crews from across the state. Plus, an Uber driver shares the moment someone opened fire on his passenger. He took a graze to the back of the hand and took three rounds to the arm right here. And voters approved it. Now, magic mushrooms are about to be legal. Then, a border brewery battle. Why some Washington beer makers are suing Oregon. Your news starts now. And first at 11, the wildfire burning in Wasco County has now scorched more than 10,000 acres. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm David Molko. And I'm Laurel Porter. While crews have now slowed down the spread, they don't have any containment of the fire yet. The Miller Road fire is burning about 13 miles southwest of Maupin. Nearly 70 firefighters are assigned to fight it, and the governor declared a state of emergency to bring in crews from around the state. The fire, which sparked yesterday afternoon, is burning in heavy grass, shrubs, and juniper, and the wind has been a major factor all day in its fast movement. We still do not have confirmation if it has burned any structures, but some neighbors in the area were absolutely worried it could be headed their way. Freaky, uh, just just really scary, terrifying experience. I think it's crazy than heck. <laughs> this is what the third year we've been in a fire danger. And really the season here just getting started. Some areas west of Maupin remain under evacuation tonight, though we just checked and those levels have not changed for better or worse since earlier today. Let's bring in meteorologist Joe Ranieri now in for Matt tonight. And Joe, what is the latest on the wind there in Wasco County? Well, the winds will start to die down here heading into our overnight hours, but they're expected to pick up heading into really late tomorrow morning and into the afternoon. So the fire is burning just south of the Dalles. Currently, the, the Dalles, you're looking at gusts up about 28, 30 miles per hour. It's been very windy through that section of the gorge all day long. Not only is it windy, very dry and hot, and that's going to be the trend over the next couple of days. I want to bring in the future cast that shows you how windy things will get heading into tomorrow. You notice near the Dalles tomorrow morning uh, and just south of the Dalles, gusts will be anywhere from about 10 to 15 miles per hour. Not a real big deal, but the concern though will be heading into tomorrow afternoon with gusts right around um, mopping up to about 25 to 30 miles per hour. And over the next couple of days, we'll see some warm conditions through that part of the state. Sunny and warm tomorrow. Temperatures right around the mid 90s for Thursday, Friday about 90 and getting into the mid 90s heading into Saturday in the early part of the week. And again, I am forecasting some warmer conditions over the next couple of days. Uh, throughout not just the central and eastern side of the state, but also through parts of the metro area. I'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Thank you, Joe. Now let's get you updated on your other top stories tonight in the McKinney fire. That's the one burning in California near the Oregon border. A total of four people have now died and the fires now burn more than 57,000 acres. Some rain has helped fire crews in the area with containment at 10% now. More thunderstorms are in the forecast and of course, while rain is welcome, lightning can spark new fires and high winds can fan existing flames. Portland police say they have arrested a suspect involved in a deadly stabbing in Old Town. 31-year-old Judy Ann Edmond appeared in court today facing a second-degree murder charge. According to court documents, a TriMet security camera captured the entire attack at Northwest 5th and Davis on Tuesday morning. Edmond allegedly stabbed the victim in the neck and then twice more when the woman fell to the ground. And the man police say drove into and hurt a Portland police officer has been arrested. 33-year-old Jacob Anderson was arrested in Idaho Tuesday. Police say Anderson tried to drive off from police after stealing a truck and hit an officer and another car, injuring the passenger. Anderson had warrants for his arrest in Multnomah, Benton, Lincoln, and Clackamas counties. Tonight, a local Uber driver is sharing his story about a terrifying shooting that left him injured and his passenger dead. You may remember he was dropping off his rider in North Portland when gunfire erupted. And so far, there have been no arrests. The Uber driver's named Josiah Kuhl. He was grazed by two bullets and struck by three. He spent a week in the hospital. And since being discharged, he spent a lot of time with family. He's even attended a concert, but he says it hasn't been easy. I think I'm blessed, but uh, I feel sorry for the passenger. So that's what I keep thinking about when I think back to that night. Is I like, couldn't help him. 
I wish I could have done more. Josiah was driving for Uber on the night of July 19th. He says as he was dropping off his passenger on North McClellan Street near Denver Avenue, a car pulled up and somebody inside started shooting. The first round I instantly heard I knew it was gunfire going over. It's a unique sound you'll never forget. It hit my driver's window and broke it. And then I got down and they started opening fire on us. Surprisingly, my passenger was able to get back into the car and tell me to drive. What a terrifying and tragic ordeal. He, he tried helping his passenger, later identified as Amir Bentley, but it was too late. The 25-year-old was gone. The case remains unsolved tonight, and Josiah is hoping anyone with information will call detectives. Washington election officials continue to count votes tonight from the primary, though as the tallies come into us, there have been no lead changes to report in the big races. But let's take a look because we're keeping a close eye, of course, on the third congressional district. Democratic challenger Marie Glusenkamp Perez with a decisive lead of 32 percent of the vote. Longtime Republican incumbent Jamie Herrera Butler is still in second here, 24 percent. Now, unless there is a big swing with those remaining ballots to be counted, those are going to be the two candidates that move on to the general election. Election in November, you see Trump endorsed retired Green Beret Joe Kent sitting there in third, Heidi St. John in fourth. Tonight on the story, Ashley Corslin took a look at what these results could signal for Republicans as we move toward the midterms. We talked to Republican political strategist Rebecca Tweed about the results. She says this is the really first competitive campaign Congresswoman Herrera Butler has had to face. And she says it's noteworthy that Trump backed Joe Kent got so much momentum. You know, for Washington and for CD3 to have such a competitive campaign and to really put an incumbent on notice, that's a message for campaigns going into November in other states, for Republicans to figure out where they're going to position themselves and for grassroots candidates who are maybe opposed to the Republicans that have moved a little to the right, they're probably more and more energized. So really watching that energy you know, for strategists like me and campaign folks, that's really a daily movement. So now more than ever, I think what's happening tonight in Washington is really setting the tone that folks need to be paying attention to. And voters are either going to be very protective of the candidates they support or probably more encouraged and more engaged to to try to unseat them in November. All right, you can check out more perspective on the Washington primary right now on the KGW YouTube channel. Do not forget to watch the story, of course, for a deeper look at the big issues of the day. That is every weekday at 6, only here on KGW. And if you're looking for results from other races or ballot measures, you can find a full list on our website, kgw.com slash elections. New tonight, three Washington breweries are suing the state of Oregon. They want to make it easier and more affordable to distribute beer across the state line. They say the laws regulating beer distribution to Oregon customers are unfair. And one of the breweries filing the lawsuit is right here in Vancouver. Catherine Cook talked with the owner tonight. At Fortside Brewing Company in Vancouver, there's always something new on tap. Stratospheric. Hazy IPA is uh, one of our latest. Co-founder Mike DeFabio is proud of what they do. He wants to share it with others, including businesses across the Columbia River, without breaking the bank. Which brings us to the latest thing Fortside is brewing up, a lawsuit against the state of Oregon. It's kind of economic discrimination. Right now, Washington brewers cannot direct ship to customers' homes in Oregon, but Oregon breweries can direct ship to Washington. That's one complaint in the lawsuit filed by Fortside and two other Washington breweries. Here's the other part. To distribute beer to Oregon businesses, Oregon law requires out-of-state breweries to go through a third-party distributor, something that, once again, Oregon breweries don't have to do when distributing to Washington. Fortside started their own distribution company in Oregon, but it's far from a fix-all. It's a whole other company, a whole other federal uh, wholesaler's permit another state permit with the OLCC. It costs us thousands of dollars a year. It's pretty excessive costs for a small business. The lawsuit addresses Oregon's three-tier control system, manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. And why it's set up that way is 
so that a manufacturer doesn't exert influence over a retailer, so that there's more, uh, you know, an even playing field for all brewers or other manufacturers. Bryant Haley is a spokesperson for the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission. Because the laws fall on the OLCC to enforce, its commissioner is named in the lawsuit. We're in a holding pattern, waiting to see what the courts play out. If the legislature wants to take action on this and perhaps give us different guidance, that's something that could come down the line. But as an administrative agency, we're set to follow the laws and statutes that are put towards us. Fortside is one of 32 breweries in southwest Washington, and right now one of just six of those that ships its beer to Oregon. They think that number would be a lot bigger if there were fewer restrictions, financial and otherwise. These guys make great beer. Um, Michael Dines is a Fortside regular but cross the Columbia and he says so many Oregonians don't know what they're missing. It just seems like there's great beer being made on both sides of it. So the, the rules around that, I think, should kind of mirror one another, in, in my opinion. Mike DeFabio will raise a glass to that. It's not like we're getting an advantage to sell to Oregon. It's just leveling the playing field. In Vancouver, Catherine Cook, KGW News.